Welcome to The, the Get, Get Together. Together! It's a show about the nuts and bolts of community building. I'm your host, Bailey Richardson. I'm a community researcher maniac. I'm Kevin Huynh. I'm also a community researcher, less of a maniac. <laughs> Debatable. Maybe. Debatable. Actually, on, very on true. Wednesdays. Very true. <laughs> Uh, each episode, Kevin and I interview people who have built communities about just how they did it. How did they get the first people to show up? How did they grow from those first people to thousands more members? And today, I have the absolute pleasure of saying that we got to talk to Lola Omulola. First name is also in her last name. But Lola started Female In, originally called Female in Nigeria. It's a secret all-female Facebook group that now three years later has 1.8 million people in it, and they're sharing some deeply vulnerable things in it every single day. Again, it's a secret Facebook group with 1.8 million people in it. In our conversation, Kevin and I asked Lola about how she personally set such a kind and generous tone in the group. Um, We also ask her about why she thinks the group took off immediately, and I mean immediately, and has continued to resonate so deeply, and what she's done to keep the group valuable to its members as it's grown to such a big size. So, Kev, what stood out to you about the conversation with Lola that we had? You know, we we get into it at the end of the conversation, uh, but the thing that stuck out to me was... You know, Lola Sensaduni as an organizer for the community. She put so much sort of time and energy and also the empathy of having to, you know, hear all of these stories, respond to these stories and and just feel what those people are feeling. And she she mentions how how Finn has become a lifeline to folks um, that people really reach out to her in crisis and uh, just her commitment to continue doing that even amidst of how much effort that would take and also her perspective on how important it is to continue that work and how others have, have, you know, have died, you know, in the name of activism around some of these same themes, I thought was incredible. Uh, I just thank her so much for sharing with us. Yeah, that comes in at the end of the interview. But I think, you know, the the thing that's very true about Lola that we talk about all the time is you can't fake the funk. Yeah. You know, if you're the first person and you're you may almost anyone who started a community that's grown, they start it from a place of personal passion. Yeah. And if you want other people to care about something, you better care about it yourself. Yeah. Don't try to start a community just because. Yeah. Like you got it. You have to have a personal reason to. Absolutely. And Lola definitely does. And you'll hear that in this interview. So let's get into it. Lola, I wanted to kick this interview off with this great quote. It's a James Baldwin quote. He said that fires can't be made with dead embers, nor can enthusiasm be stirred by spiritless men. Mm -hmm. And Kevin and I like to say, like, a lot of community leaders just can't fake the funk. Like, you have to care if you want other people to care. So I wanted to ask you about just how you got to the point where you realized you needed to create connection to other Nigerian women, start like bringing people together. Can you take us on the journey of how you got there? Um, I, my story didn't start the day I hit create group on Finn at all. I mean, and this is something that is really difficult to communicate to people is they think the community is owned because it's only three years old, that that's it. But that isn't it. I had to go through a personal awakening myself as an individual. I was only 11 when I first learned that I just realized, I woke up to the fact that my experience as a woman was different from my brother's experience. And it was just, I found it super shocking that the expectations that were placed on me were different. <laughs> what, what happened when you were 11? Okay, so there was, yeah, so there was this, uh, f- there was a party at our family house and I was actually preparing for an exam in school. And then my dad, you know, told me, you need to sit there so you can study and, you know, get ready for your exam on Monday. I said, okay, dad, I'm just going to sit here. And here's the thing. Whenever they have those events, you'll see women running around trying to clean and trying to, you know, do the cooking and put everything in order. And everyone, so while I was in there doing, you know, my studying, um, women just kept coming in like every five minutes or so to say to me, we need you in the kitchen to come help, you know, clean the plates. Like we have a mountain of plates and we need your help like right now. And I said, well, I can't leave because I'm, you know, prepping for my exam. And dad said that I have to stay here so that I can do that. 
I looked up the window when the th about the, I think the third or fourth persons came into the room to go ask me to do the same task. And I looked out the window and I saw my brother was right there playing football in the quadrangle. Like nobody went to him. Not a single person had an expectation of him doing that. And he was apparently free. He wasn't doing mm. anything. Mm. So, um, I, you know, my, my parent did come back and was like, okay, so what's, I said, everyone keeps asking me to go watch the plates. And so they, my dad literally had to go over to them to say, it's important that she studies and no one should bother her. This was the first day it occurred to me that, mm. oh my God, I literally asked the woman and she said, don't tell me who to ask to do this. I'm, I'm asking you. So you drop everything and come watch the plates. Wow. So it was at that moment that I first experienced it. And it was the moment I was awoke to the fact that the expectations that were placed on me, absolutely different from that which was based on my brother. So of course I asked my mom and my dad about it. And my dad took the time to explain it to me. And, you know, it was just a heck of an experience. And so that's like you have a special dad. Oh my God. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was at that, I think that it was from that moment that I started then paying attention to it and I started seeing it in everything. And you know, you know how it is. The moment yeah. you're awake and you just can't shut it back off. And there are times when mm. you want to, <laughs> you, you actually can't. Mm. And so that was what happened to me on that, that, you know, woke me up to that fact. And then in 2014, prior, you know, even then, there were several choices I'd made in my personal life that reflected my understanding of that experience. You know what I mean? Um, but beyond that, in 2014, um, I turned on the news. I was living here in Chicago. I had moved here from Nigeria in 2001. And I realized, I, I heard the news that this armed men had stormed a school in Nigeria and they kidnapped 276 girls. It's been years and I'm still, I, I still cannot believe that happened. Yeah. I think I stopped sleeping that day. Most of my life, I have been thinking about different ways with which I can try to highlight the issues relating to women that I was seeing, that my body, my soul, my heart wasn't agreeing with, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to go about doing anything. So I just kind of went with the flow and I notice it and I speak up about it where I can. But, but that event that happened with those men kidnapping those girls was what forced me to know that it was time for me to do something. So that was what happened specifically to motivate starting my community. Now, I have to tell you, go prior to that, I hadn't been a member of any group on Facebook that was mm. anything like that. So I had no reference point whatsoever. Mm. I just knew that I wanted to do something to amplify the voices of women. Whenever I turned on the radio and TV following that event, everyone wanted to talk about terrorism. Everyone wanted to talk about how that was responsible for what happened. But I had a completely different take on it. And it was something that I had been awakened mm. to since I was a child. And it was that we have a community here. We have a society here that had built structures. I'm talking cultural structures, um, the religious structures. I'm talking, I mean, serious and major structures that were designed to systemically essentially raise men and condition our men to think of women as being not worth that much. And the same structures with preparing women and conditioning women to be silent and not speak up. So we were getting trained to endure the whatever discomforts were thrown our way, whatever pains, whatever. So in the face of violence, we shut up. In the face of pain, we don't say anything. And that was what I needed to tackle because I felt that that was the foundational issues was to get women to speak up. Yep, absolutely. So how did you do that in the beginning? I mean, did you know before you started the Facebook group, you did that logical thought process, which was, you know what, we need to humanize ourselves. We need to voice that we are full human thinking beings. And I'll do that by creating a space for women to do that. Or was it more just like, I need to say something and took it to Facebook and it evolved from there? Oh, no, it, it, it was it, it was nothing like that. What our community became, it's not you don't plan that. <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> uh, my thought was to, quite frankly, find women who were like me and were, you know, losing sleep over these issues and were concerned that 
women that, that we weren't bonding, we weren't creating real, authentic relationships that were enduring. We were a pretentious bunch where we worried about things and we don't actually talk about it. Mm. You know, people were angry a lot, <laughs> but no one was really talking about the whys of things. So what my initial idea was, was to give, uh, you know, create a space where I could find women who were like me, who were as worried about the same thing. And then we could all come together and form some sort of a resource and maybe decide to do a podcast or, uh, you know, just figure out ways that we can amplify women's voices. Yeah. So find the people first and then figure out what to do. Exactly. I just wanted to see if that was, if I was crazy and I was the only one who was, you know, worried, so worried about this that I was losing sleep over it. Uh, and that was what I started the community for. It was supposed to be a way for me to cast a wide, crazy net and see if there were other women like me. So um, how did you do that? I know the name is very specific. It's like, are you a female? Are you Nigerian? It's like females in Nigeria. If I see that, I know if I'm one of them. But how did you get those very first people? How did you meet the first strangers? Mm-hmm. Well, we, um, our group was female in Nigeria. It is now female in because we kept the acronym. Uh, it's now female in because we started getting so diverse so yeah. fast. And mm-hmm. lots of women were coming into the community saying that, I know this is female in Nigeria, but I have a story to tell and I've never found any space more comfortable for me to tell it. So we just decided to drop the geographic you know, limitations so that every woman who wanted a place would know that she was welcome here. Yeah, I want to ask you about that decision a little bit more in detail, just because this is something we see with so many communities of, do we keep that group tight so that it's really meaningful for that early group or do we grow? But tell me again, you know, how, so how, who are these very, very first women? And yeah, I, I'm just curious as to how they found you or you found them and just got the early momentum going. When I created the group, the first thing I knew that I needed to do was go find individuals that I already knew that, you know, they knew what they were doing because I, I had no idea what I was doing. Never created a group. I'd barely ever been in one. So I knew a woman that I'd met online who had issues with her group. And I, you know, she ran a community of more than 200,000 people at that time. And so I reached out to her and asked if she wanted to come on board to help me with my new group. And then I went to another woman who I knew to be a champion for women um, on several different issues and she spoke up a lot. So I invited both of them to assist me um, in whatever way they could. Now, I knew what the issues were and I wanted to talk about them, to highlight them. So I went throughout the internet to find information about those issues. I did a little bit of research. So what I did was I found snippets of quotes where women said the issue that I wanted to talk about, they talked about it in those quotes. So from Twitter to Facebook to blogs. Regular um, women or kind of regular women. women? Regular yeah. women. Awesome. Regular women. So for instance, I'm going to give you a quick example. Like say a woman said, I wasn't even allowed to date until I was 24. And my parents wanted me to have a husband by the time I was 24 and a half. Like <laughs> in two weeks after dating, like you got it. Where is he? Like I'm not understanding when I was meeting his family. <laughs> <laughs> these were, these are, or, you know, oh, I would see a post where as a woman said, yesterday, I tried to go get an apartment because I just, you know, I'm a widow now and I lost my, my husband and we need a house to stay. But the landlord said, I'm sorry that we're not going to rent to a woman unless you bring a man with you. If you do not, you might be a prostitute or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. So yeah. essentially women could not rent their own apartments. They can't. You, know, you have an expectation that if you do not come with a man, something you know is not right about you. So that was oh, what. So I was I found- just going to say, it sounds like your taste in what's interesting to a woman today, and in particular, a Nigerian woman, made a huge difference as to whether or not people wanted to be in the group. Like you pulled out because of your life experience, 
all of these things that you were like, yep, that person is talking about something I know is emblematic. Absolutely. But at that point, what my expectation was, was not to use it as a tool to drag people in at all. It was for me, I expected that when I highlighted those um, sentences and you know, those comments, and I quoted them and I put them on my group. What my expectation was, was the women who we had invited to the groups, which were just friends that we, you know, we knew online. I thought that they were just going to have a wide angle conversation about those issues, kind of like punditry and just say, what, well, like, that's terrible that this is still happening in today's age. Like, who's, who's going to do something about this? These things don't get talked about in the media and that like, we don't discuss those things. Everyone is saying, you know, we're trying to highlight the big ideas, but what about the small stuff? They seem like small stuff, except they are issues that women have to deal with every single day while we're being systemically criminalized in our own lives. Yeah. While you're trying to study and having to wash the dishes. (laughs) Exactly. And there are little boys running around and no one is going to go ask them, you know? Yeah. So that was what my expectation was at that point. But boy, was I surprised quickly. That wasn't how it went at all. Hmm. The way it went instead was the new members we'd added, they just started talking about what happened to them. They went personal, real personal, really quickly. Hmm. Like they were just, oh my God, that happened to me yesterday. Oh my God, this happened to my sister. Yes, that captures what I'm saying. This is happening to me right now. I was just at the barbing salon to cut my hair and the guy said, you can't cut your hair. You have to bring a note from your husband saying Mm. it's okay to cut your hair. Mm. And just in a nuts and bolts way, did that mean that people would take a quote that you had posted on Facebook to a group and would they then just comment or would they share that quote? Like, you know, how did that live? Because obviously something about the internet that makes that different is it can get passed in some way, right? Right. It, it was, it was, they were interacting with it. They were just essentially making comments about it. And within those comments, they were talking about what their own experiences were. I realized that it's really a powerful thing. It was a big realization that because I didn't do a narration along with those quotes, I I didn't frame the conversation. I didn't inject myself into that experience. And therefore, that helped to define for them how they should behave within that community. I had highlighted another woman's voice. And that woman, and I made clear on there that I was highlighting her voice because I had quotes around it. Mm -hmm. I have, my background is in broadcast journalism. So it is natural to me to like quote something that I didn't say. And so they were there and they they just immediately felt it communicated to them a cue to tell their own experience as well. Absolutely. Who knew? Yeah, we, uh, it's funny. I think the main thing the community team did for Instagram was to tell stories about interesting ways other people were taking photos or to create suggested users that were doing interesting things with photos because we mimic each other. We mimic what we see. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. You made role model, you kind of role modeled the behavior that people just picked up and copied. It's really unbelievable, I'm telling you, because right when that happened and everyone just kept started saying what had happened to them as their response or the, the way they interacted with the story of the individuals that I, I highlighted. In fact, I mean, I'm talking some of them were even one liners. They were one or two liners, very simple and very easy to, to digest. And these guys just immediately the stories that were coming out, their responses were so raw. Mm-hmm. It was so, I mean, they were juicier than the original thing that I had found on the internet. Plus, this was more of a safer space because it's an enclosed space. And so more people were just sharing and sharing. And they started, they just couldn't, I think the people were just surprised at just how deep folks were going, that they just went back to their profiles and added every woman they knew wow. to the community. Wow. And they just couldn't believe it because oh, you have to remember. Like you have to see this kind of thing. You have to, exactly. You have to remember that we're dealing in a culture that this is not the norm yeah. at all. This yeah. is a culture where you, something is wrong with you. You don't go to a shrink. If something is wrong with you, you just go to the same traditional spaces. And those are the traditional spaces 
that are systemically structured hmm. to essentially undermine or historically devalue your voice. So what is the traditional space that a Nigerian woman would go to where you also feel like not actually comfortable? Is it, do you mean like if you get, you need to talk to a cop and you have to go to a, a policeman and then you're in a... No, you're, not a that's a good question, but no, yeah. not really. It's, it's different. It's like you go to a family elder, mm. uh, someone who is older in the family, or you go to the person that is respected in the community to go tell that you know, something is wrong, or you go to, even if you have a problem or issues with your spouse, you would go to your mother-in-law. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> That's a hard one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like you were, you were screwed right yeah, out walking the into the lion's den <laughs> on that one. <laughs> you, you know, exactly. Or you go to your religious house where, you know, you go. And the, the reality is that lots of the dogma does not, is not really necessarily accommodating of your individual experience. Absolutely. So these are the only options that were available. Are there any particular stories that stick out from when you first started the group that you thought you yourself were like, wow, I, I didn't expect this to happen? Oh my God, let me tell you. I was like, wow, all the time when we just got started. Narrations were so deep. It was like a pressure cooker had just burst. Mm. I struggled with sleeping. I struggled with eating. I couldn't believe just how the depth of pain and burden people had been carrying mm. in their lives. Um, I, I remember one of the early ones where a woman had not shared and told anyone for 40 years that she had, was being sexually assaulted by her father. Oh, God. And I remember a story where a woman had, she had gone into the comments and expressed that she, she didn't even say it as her story. It was kind of like a weird you know, third party narration. It was a story about a woman who was undergoing domestic violence and her husband would drag her a block down the road and no one would stand up for her. Mm. And no one said anything. And she was forced to stay up at night. And then there was another story I remember of a, a woman who she wrote on the community as it was happening. And she oh, put wow. the photos as she was hiding in the corner of her kitchen away from the spouse who was pummeling her in front of their child. Wow. And, and then a sto another story of a woman who was on the highway and she wrote a post saying right now she was contemplating killing herself and she just needed anyone to give her a reason why she shouldn't do that. Wow. This is like, yeah, this is how it works. So in those early days, Lola, you start putting posts up and do you just immediately kind of start seeing people joining the group in crazy numbers? Like, tell me the timeline of when you're like, oh, I'm going to do this. I feel like this is important. I don't know if anyone else is interested to like, wow, other people are showing up to this. I get asked that question a lot. <laughs> Interestingly, people want to know if there was a moment, that was a shotgun moment where it just happened and it started mm -hmm. happening. I have to tell you, it was pretty immediate. <laughs> it was pretty immediate. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty immediate because number one, I noticed that from the, I think that the moment I start, I began to engage in the community, which is really immediately. And I started to set a tone of kindness, compassion, that we were not going to, you know, make any exceptions. That it was important here in this space for us to prioritize the voice of the individual who was stepping out of her comfort zone and being courageous to tell her story. The fact that we do not judge and we were serious about enforcing it. I think that that culture of kindness that I had instilled in those first couple of days and people watching the complete commitment to making that a reality, I think that was what got people beyond even the stories is that I was there around the clock. I'm telling you, I wasn't, at some point I wasn't going to sleep. Hmm. I stayed up. My background is in journalism. So I understand in real terms, practically and academically, how to keep people transfixed. I understand it. Hmm. So, you know, and therefore, that is exactly what I did. 
I knew that people were, were really interested in, in talking about those issues. And yeah, tell me the secret. How do you keep people transfixed? Do you let them know you're there? What, what is it? No, no. For instance, I'm going to give you a good example. Okay, so when I started highlighting those posts, uh, those comments that I told you around from the internet, I then realized that people were really interacting with it. And the engagement was through the roof right away. So I then started noticing, because obviously you have to listen and pay attention as well. You know, patterns will start to emerge and you can start to take note of them. And I noticed that people were talking about their experiences. And I saw that some of the comments, they were more in-depth and they were relatable. Even the stories that I had found initially. Hmm. So I did what any sensible person would do. I highlighted those comments. Mm. I highlighted those comments. I made and put a spotlight on them. I made, so I essentially expanded the conversation is what and I did. And acknowledged the people who made excellent contributions. Absolutely. Just like a byline. I did it exactly like, you know, did their codes, put their names on it, that this was a comment made by this person. So even if, you know, like normally when you get into a new group, you're not really quick to want to, you know, do a post. You want to kind of watch and see what's going on. And then if there's a lot of people, you're like, okay, you're very queasy about sharing your personal stories. <laughs> so this was a nudge. It literally nudged them to see that, look, I can share my story and I'm still alive. Nothing is going to happen. Like mm -hmm. it's not. So this actually had several different effects. It's expanded the story. It, um, you know, helped people see that it was okay for them to share their stories here and that they were not going to be insulted or they were not going to be treated badly mm -hmm. and they were going to be appreciated and no one was going to judge them. Yeah. And it also helped them feel comfortable about, you know, being a part of that community. They felt like they were part of something bigger yeah. than themselves. Uh, and then they saw me everywhere. And I was doing it feverishly, I'm telling you. I think I posted like hundreds. I made hundreds of those, you know, over the, the first 24 hours. I just went wow. and I was doing it. I, I didn't sleep. I did not sleep. For wow. days when I just started, I was doing it around the clock. And I was just doing it. I mean, it got to a point where members would, were like, you really need to let me go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, well, how captivating, yeah. God. They would, so they, yeah, they would literally go into the comments and be like, please, Lala, I need to sleep. I haven't slept for days. I'm like a crazy lady over here. Like, <laughs> like they just couldn't believe my commitment to it. And they, they started feeling um, protective of me. Like members would come into the comments or see me like either making a copious response to something or doing something. And they would like, Lola, isn't it like 3 a.m. in Chicago? Shouldn't you be sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Like, so it's not a single thing that was responsible for growth. Well, it sounds and, like you seized the momentum. Thank you. And yeah. understanding the power of momentum is very necessary. Understanding the power of having the wind behind your back and knowing how to ride it. Mm -hmm. And being able to make the sacrifice it takes to take it from the top to the bottom. You have to prioritize it. And the funny thing is, I wasn't trying to be strategic those early days. I was just excited. Yeah. Because this is something, you know, I, I was living in my authentic truth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is something that had mattered to me all of my life. And there I was. I wasn't just finding people who were like me. I was finding people who were passionate about what was passionate to me. Mm -hmm. that I had been alone worrying about and thinking about. And suddenly, it was validation everywhere I turned that people wanted to talk about these things that we were raised with a pinch and shush to shut up about. Yeah. It's, Lola, it also strikes me because we get people asking, you know, about companies and stuff, about moderating, and do you moderate the group, and da-da-da-da-da. And I think that it sounds as though it's not just about the topic that you offer people, you know, to talk about something that they had not been able to. It's also the way they could speak about it, you know, with kindness, with a lack of judgment. And you created that culture because that was natural to you to do yeah. that. It wasn't some big strategy. And I want to ask you, I know you have like moderators now and you're at 1.8 million people in the private group. How do you keep the conversations valuable as you've 
grown or even just moderate as you grow? How do you approach that? How have you evolved that early cultural tone you set? I speak with several admins. I also happen to be the regional lead of, for Chicago for the Facebook community leadership circles. So one of the major problems that community uh, builders and you know, community people bring up is, how do I grow my group? and still be able to maintain the, you know, the strong sense of commitment and, you know, the connection. How do I keep it authentic? We have, you have a million people here, literally. I have to be honest. It's unbelievable. I have so to amazing. be honest. The answer is, I used to say it's not rocket science, but I'm starting to understand that it might be. Mm. How do we connect? Vulnerability. It's not very complicated, actually. We, the way we connect and the way we transform our relationships from just random to really deep connection is whenever we talk about ourselves or when we go through something in our lives. And that is the simple thing that we do in our community. Mm-hmm. When we started growing, lots of community members were terrified. They were like, oh my God, we're going to lose this. We're going to, I mean, they were coming out and doing posts about it and commenting about it because that was the norm and they just said, oh we're gonna lose all of this it's, you know come on you know whatever we need to keep it down to 10,000 and my response to them was so what you're saying is that we would actively lock out women who we know should be here that's not fair so it was that service mindset that forced me to think about a way to deal with it yeah. and the way, the way I've dealt with it is simple whenever we're vulnerable it enhances our ability to connect meaningfully. It goes without saying that what that means is for us to tighten up the kind of posts that we approve in our community. We keep it vulnerable. We keep it such that the posts and the stories are significant. When they're significant, we don't have to lose what we have. We don't have to lose it at all. What then happened was, okay, so before in the past, when we just got started, I mean, we would allow people to post questions, you know, random questions and things that has to do with their lives or their experiences. We no longer approve those kinds of posts because we have made the, con- the posts that we actually approve much more personal. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the more, the more vulnerable, the, the more we get, the more vulnerable we're becoming. And mm-hmm. the more vulnerable our expectations of our members are, mm-hmm. the more significant the stories need to get, the higher the stakes of posting in our community. We only approve like two out of a hundred posts mm-hmm. or more. And how do you go through and decide? Is, do each admin, does each admin have the power to approve or do you guys agree on them together? Yeah, how does that work? I am the only admin. Ah. Um, every, Facebook changed the rules. So we now have moderators who yes. are okay. essentially, uh, yeah, they are volunteers and they are amazing people who are just, it, it's unbelievable that they are joining me in this crazy journey. You know, we have the training program, so they know what to do, what to approve and what not to. But we all work. We are working all the time we are reading every single post we are and don't forget in our community what people see on the forum is not even 20 percent of the work most of the work is happening at the back we are also going inbox we have a triage system you know whenever our members have issues in their lives they think to contact me first before like they even think about like calling the police you're the new you're the new local elder you're the elder. No, I, have a, I have a visual. I have a visual. <laughs> you know? They, no, they, you know, so they, they essentially, like, go and be like, this happened. And mm-hmm. they know that they're going to, first, they're going to meet someone who is not going to judge them. They're going to meet someone who is going to listen. We have spent hours on the phone talking people off the ledge. It goes beyond just a community. It is a lifeline now. It is a, it is a way of life. Uh, where people know that they will find solutions from people who are willing and already have a mindset that is positive and is geared towards their comfort. Can I, well, so I'm going to ask you a little bit of a personal question, Lola. When Uh, I finished working at Instagram, I was really tired emotionally because it was so personal for me. Like I met and got to know so many of the people that were a part of it. And I've heard that from some other people that we've interviewed. And I can tell that you put, have put so much into this, not just not sleeping in the beginning, but 
some of these posts must affect you so much emotionally and these relationships must affect you so much emotionally. How do you manage that yourself? Just how do you take care of yourself, you know, kind of going through being strong for other people all the time? Um, I'm going to tell you, I struggle. I struggle. Yeah. I struggle because it's hard to, to, to see people go through so much. But if I don't do it, no one will. Yeah. And I just feel like if this is the price that I have to pay for that, I mean, I just think that, I mean, there are people who have done amazing things in this world and they have lost their lives. People have died for some of the, the benefits that I enjoy today. I just, I feel like it is a privilege that I get to do this and that people like trust me with their stories, even though they've been hurt over and over and over again. And I, I just, I just feel like I need to complain because of that. Um, I'm not the best person with self-care. I struggle with self-care. Uh, but the good news is I have amazing people around me yeah. who, who completely love me and who take care of me. I, you know, I have a great family. My husband is, you know, a dream. You know, I, I have things that lots of people who share the experiences don't have yeah. that I can point to. I, I just feel like this isn't too much of a sacrifice to make for, for all the things that I have. Yeah. I, and it is a hard sacrifice. And there are days when I can't barely cope. Yeah. There are days when I have to take a break. And there are days when I, I struggle, I can't sleep. For the past three years, on, just up until last month, I, I slept two to four hours for the entire three years. Wow. Yeah. This is the, the real cost, the real cost mm -hmm. of, of being this person. And then I have empathy in and of itself, his work. Yeah. Um, and just beyond the fact that it is just who I am, I, you take on the energy, whether it's good news or it's bad news, you walk right into somebody else's experience. And then I have to, you have to do it all day and all night. It is, it takes a toll um, emotionally. But um, the thing is, I just feel, I just feel like <laughs> it's the least I can do because for the benefits that I enjoy today, there are people who have lost their lives. Yeah. I feel like I'm lucky. I'm lucky out, <laughs> actually. Yeah. So yeah, I struggle, but I, you know, sometimes I suck it up, and sometimes when I need help, I ask. And Facebook has actually really helped a lot. They have a lot of new tools now that make it less of a burden to do a lot of things that we mm. you know, that we used to find hacks to to do. You like know, moderation like, and approval. Yeah, like lots of new tools and lots of, mm -hmm. you know, things that you can do uh, without spending all the time to do it manually. We used to manually approve all those members one by one. <laughs> yeah. And we had a lot. They were 1. coming in every day. <laughs> yeah. What, like what the first... Our, our growth has always been each day, anytime, for any, anywhere from one to 4,000 new members a day is what we get. And we would do this. And, but now Facebook has done it that we don't have to focus on the small stuff yeah. as much. So it is, I, I feel like we're improving. I'm improving. I'm, I'm much better now with a lot of things. Yeah. Well, just, I feel like there's so few opportunities to truly serve other people. And I just think that what you're doing is incredible and I'm sure it's challenging, but absolutely. There are very few people that have momentum to actually serve others. So thank you for, for doing that. It's an amazing story. And I just want to ask you one more question so that we don't take too much of your time unless Kevin's burning with one over there. But if you had a magic wand and you could do like you could do anything for the Finn community, what would you, what would you use your wand to offer people in the community or your team? I would take Finn to the real world, to them and their communities. I would create 30 resource centers around the world in strategic places where women know that they can walk in and the experience that they have in our community, they can have it in their local area because there are women who don't have access to the internet. There are women who don't have access to good internet. There are women who don't have access to any internet at all. And I would like to be able to reach them too. 
and in the tone and in the heart of the community we have built to be able to bring that to where it would become a real life alternative, not just of an online, well, we have real life events too, we have massive events, but I would like to be able to have a real, an alternative that, uh, to the cultural, the, you know, the traditional spaces where women, where women have to gather because they don't have options and provide a real option that they can walk into and know that they will be trained. They will help, you know, someone will walk with them to where they can each become an advocate for their own lives. Yeah. That is what I want. That sounds awesome. I've seen that in some of your news stories too. How do you get there? How, can we help? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, keep us posting. I don't know if there's any way we can help or our, our, our networks can help, but it sounds, I think it makes amazing sense. So absolutely. Thank you. That's honestly, that's all I want. I think that we can do better. I think that it's unbelievable that even even those of us who are so well, who like have, you know, education and who are enlightened, who have like all the degrees in the world, still struggle with emotional intelligence. And if we do not figure that out, and if we do not become active students of compassion and conflict management, we will always fall short we will always fall short in the way we handle our relationships, in the way we raise our children, in the choices of careers we make. And I think that no one, no woman, should have to live a subpar life because she didn't have access to the information that may make a difference for her life. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just really want to be, I am ready to spend my entire life making sure I change that. Mm -hmm. And I have two daughters, so, you know, that's amazing. My, I'm just going to share this with personal. My, my mom was one of the first commercial airline pilots. She flew for United Woo! Airlines. That is yeah. amazing. It is amazing. And it completely shaped me as a person. It's like I realize more and more every year, you know, how much it means to me that that was the story I got to tell about my mom. Wow. I had so many people say to me, which, you know, I'd be like, oh, my mom's a pilot. And they'd be like, you mean she's a flight um, attendant? And I would be like, like no, no, I mean she's a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, but I'm that, sure your daughters must. How did that affect you? you? Like how, you feel so much pride, yes? Absolutely. I mean, yes. and my dad was great too, but just, it sounds like your dad was similarly, like gender was not, it did not dictate who I could be in any way at, at all. Like it never, I didn't, even, I didn't even realize, I never really realized I was my dad's daughter. I've never mm. thought of myself as his daughter ever. Mm. I just felt like I was his child. Yeah, and, absolutely. And absolutely. this is particularly starkly crazy because we come from a community that that wasn't what he was taught, you know, mm. just an African man. But he made the choice. He was enlightened. He made yeah. the choice to seek wisdom for himself. And he decided to do something different. Look now. Look yeah. what's happening now. Absolutely. I, mean, I am this, you know, lady who is seeing, you know, a, a cause for service, uh, for serving others. And it's, you're very right. I'm so, wow. Yeah. That's so anyway, cool. here's to badass moms like you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lola, you're amazing. We, sometimes we're in Chicago, so I'll definitely let you know if you come through. Maybe we can buy you a drink or food or something. But thank you. I so would much. love that. I would yeah. love that. Where, where are you guys located? We're in New York City. So if you're ever here, oh. let us know. I really would love to meet you. And thanks for doing all the hard work. I'm, I'm sure you've been working your butt off, but it seems like it's actually really, really meaningful. Lots of people work all nighters. It doesn't mean anything to anyone. <laughs> Don't anything. tell them. Don't tell them. <laughs> 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 thank you so much i really appreciated this time and yeah. i love the opportunity to talk about finn right. and, and the great women uh, there and their courage to defy a culture that is oppressing them and ruining their lives thank you so much lola thank Thanks, you lola. The pleasure is all yeah. mine thanks you have a wonderful day guys you too bye 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 Lola, that was incredible. If you guys enjoyed that as much as Kevin and I did, you can apply to be a part of the Facebook group and see Lola in there. The URL is facebook.com backslash female in fin. That's female, I-N-F-I-N, no spaces. And you can also search female in female in on facebook awesome thank you lola um if you want to find out more about us people and company 
um, Kevin Bailey, also our business partner, Kai. Our website is people-and.com, people-and.com, or say hi at peopleand.com. That's the email address, hi at peopleand.com. Groovy. Cool. See you guys next time. See you next time.